Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar tonight called Geographic Atrophy Treatment Now and in the Future, featuring Dr. Corey Elkins and Dr. Brandon Runyon. Thank you so much, guys, for being here tonight. It's really an honor to have you and really looking forward to learning um, what you have to say and, and everything about geographic atrophy treatment. This is definitely a hot topic, so thanks again. Next slide. So I'm your host, I'm Dr. Elise Kramer, and I'm located in Miami, Florida. Next. And we'd like to thank Iberic Bio for exhibiting at this event. Next slide. So just a few housekeeping things for each hour of CE units, attendees must be online for a minimum of 50 minutes. For a COPE certificate, you can fill out the survey link in the chat, so we will put the link there. The survey link will also appear uh, toward the end of the webinar. So if you don't get it now, you can get it later. And CE certificates will be delivered by email and sent to Arbo with OE tracker numbers. We're also gonna be displaying a QR code at the end of the event. So if you have the OE tracker app on your phone, you can just scan that and then uh, it will get the CE right away but you can't use your smartphone camera. You really have to have the OE Tracker app. If you don't have the app, don't worry. Um, again, we are going to be sending those certificates within four weeks. You can ask questions using the Zoom on-screen floating panels. You could see there either in the chat or Q&A, although we do recommend putting them in Q&A if possible. Next slide. All right, so you can see that over there again. Next slide. So now Dr. Corey Elkins is a board certified retina specialist and a fellow of the American Society of Retina Specialists. After completing medical school at Tulane University, she went on to complete her ophthalmology training at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, followed by vitreo retinal surgery fellowship at the University of Iowa. She's been practicing at Tidewater Eye Centers in coastal Virginia since 2010. Thanks so much again, Dr. Elkins, for being here. Next slide. Next slide. And Brandon Runyon uh, completed a chemistry degree from Moorhead U State University in 2009 and obtained his optometry degree at the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Optometry in 2013. Following graduation, he completed a residency program in family practice at ocular disease at Northeastern State University, Oklahoma College of Optometry in 2014. Following residency, Dr. Runyon spent nearly seven years working for the Indian Health Service in a hospital-based practice in Chinle, Arizona, serving as staff optometrist, residency coordinator, and later chief of optometry services. Over the last two years, he has worked exclusively in medical and surgical eye care as a consultative optometrist at Virginia Eye Consultants in Norfolk, Virginia, and also serves as residency co-coordinator for the optometry residency program. Dr. Runyon is an adjunct clinical faculty for the Pennsylvania College of Optometry at Salus University, Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, University of Incarnate World, Rosenberg School of Optometry and Pacific University. His areas of interest are emergency eye care, neuro-ophthalmology, autoimmune eye disease, and uveitis. Thank you so much again, Dr. Runyon, for being here. And with that, I will let you guys take it away. All right, we'll jump right in. So Dr. Elkins and I are going to talk about geographic atrophy treatment now and in the future. Um, to get started, we're going to do a normal anatomy refresher. Um, so as you probably recall, the outer retina is the area that's affected in macular degeneration. You have the photoreceptor layer that sits on top of the RPE. The RPE is you know, nourishing the photoreceptor layer and providing nutrition for, for the photoreceptor layer. Um, the RPE sits directly on top of Brooks membrane, which is predominantly made up of collagen and elastin. And you know, it's separating the choriocapillaris from the RPE. As we age, Brooks membrane tends to accumulate debris in the elastin lamina and also drusen form between that collagen layer and the RPE basal lamina. Aging is also associated with the thinning and breakdown of that central elastin layer uh, within Brooks membrane. And a combination of these things uh, allow blood vessels in the choriocapillaris a potential inlet to grow through. 
Um, so jumping into the pathophysiology of geographic atrophy, there are several intrinsic and extrinsic stressors of poorly regenerative RPE. Some of those things include oxidative stress, you know, such as high metabolic demand of the photoreceptors, photooxidation, which is the constant stimulation by light producing those free oxygen radicals, um, which can lead to damage, environmental stressors, such as cigarette smoking, which is a major risk factor in, in AMD pathogenesis, and then patient-specific factors such as age, a poor diet, specifically a high-fat diet, increased BMI, and genetic polymorphisms. So, you know, thinking about those things, there's sort of two schools of thought, I guess, is one is an increasing amount of, of damage occurring over the time um, or a cumulative amount of damage, you know, from things such as cigarette smoking over time. But both of those things result in drusen and lipofusin deposit in the retina and accumulated components within those um, drusen and lipofusin trigger inflammation leading to atrophic AMD or geographic atrophy as we know it. So, you know, to talk about the pathogenesis, we have to get into a little bit of immunology. The, the complement system, as you may recall, is part of the innate immune system. There's three arms of that system. There's the classical complement system, which is activated by an antigen antibody complex, so IgM and IgG. There's a lectin complement system, which is activated by polysaccharides, polysaccharides on the surface of microorganisms, and that can be bacteria, viruses, fungi, fungi um, or protozoans. And then you have the alternative complement system, which is actually the first complement system that we knew about and makes up to about 80% of the total complement activation. And the way that it works is by amplifying the classic pathway and or the lectin pathway via a low-level self-activated hydrolysis of complement factor 3, and it may also independently operate um, away from those other pathways. So it's kind of always going in the background, it has the ability to switch on and off on its own, and that's why it makes up the majority of the complement activation. So this slide here is a little busy. I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible. You should be able to see the uh, central portion here. This is the classical pathway where you can see an antigen antibody complex um, that's activated that system and the downstream cascade through the other complement factors, ultimately leading to this uh, complement factor three activation here. The lectin pathway, as I mentioned before, there's a polysaccharide on the surface of some type of pathogen you know, that stimulates uh, the recruitment of these proteins, which later results downstream in C3 activation. And then the main component or the, the majority component, the alternative pathway here, you can see there's um, C3 that's sort of floating freely it's self-hydrolyzed, you know, water component or water molecules are added. And then ultimately this complex is cleaved into active C3 again over here. And downstream from C3, the, uh, the, this portion of the pathway is where amplification of C3 really occurs. And C3 has been a major target for a lot of uh, AMD treatments and trials at this point. So, Moving on to the next slide here, this is a little bit of a busy slide, so I'm going to try to break it down as simply as possible. So on the top, we sort of have the um, outer retina, Brooks membrane choriocapillaris, and it's showing drusen formation and uh, RPD, which is reticular pseudodrusen formation. Specifically, drusen form below the RPE, reticular pseudodrusen form above the RPE, as you can see here. And you know, the main role and the, the main process that this is showing is the communication of these apolipoproteins um, and lipids back and forth across Brooks membrane from the RPE to the choriocapillaris. So, you know, th throughout this diagram, these little yellow dots are the apolipoprotein E's, which is very important in AMD pathogenesis. And then you also have amyloid beta as well present in the drusen. So under normal circumstances, you know, the RPEs um, using these apolipoproteins to transport lipids and other metabolic uh, byproducts across Brooks membrane back and forth to the choriocapillaris to whisk them away in, in systemic circulation. Um, in the process of AMD, something kind of goes haywire in that process and you end up with buildup of 
you know, these byproducts and waste products, and that leads to deterioration and, and cell death. So moving to the bottom here, um, this I'll move kind of left to right. So you can see this portion here where the outer segment lipid recycling occurs between the rods and cones and RPE. Um, and between the RPE and Brooks membrane, you have lipid exchange with the circulation. Again, that's done by those apolipoproteins and some other transport proteins. Um, both of those processes, whether you know it's in the outer retina or if it's below the RPE, are they going to result in either drusen or pseudodrusen? And that's going to activate that complement system that I just showed you on the previous slide. And that essentially, all that's going to result in is chronic inflammation, later leading to atrophic AMD or neovascular AMD. So the darker yellow rectangles on this figure are sort of the additional stressors or additional risk factors for um, producing chronic inflammation and leading to more advanced AMD. And that can be anything from uh, oxidative stress. You know, the ARMS2 variant is a genetic uh, variant, which leads to advanced AMD. Um, and then you also see the the local apolipoprotein E2. And again, that's a transport uh, molecule. It's sort of been documented to be a trigger. So it kind of turns on these microglia, which are neuronal cells that sort of stimulate chronic inflammation. It um, causes macrophages to be recruited, which leads to inflammation and also activates complement system. Um, Dr. Elkins, do you have anything you want to add to what I just said about that process? Um, no, the only real thing I, to think about in terms of that is apolipoprotein E is kind of an interesting molecule because the wild type form of it is the three version. And in this case, we're talking about the two. Um, so if you have three as your genetic makeup, then you're at lower risk for AMD. Um, but increased um, allele two, which is the apo um, E2 that we're talking about here, actually increases your risk of AMD. But Interestingly, it decreases your risk for Alzheimer's. And the converse is true of apolipoprotein E4. More of that increases your risk of Alzheimer's, but decreases your risk of macular degeneration. So, um, you know, it's a very, you know, interesting kind of allele. And you have to remember that complement factor H, which helps control some of this inflammation stuff, um, is also a genetic risk factor. So you end up with a double whammy if you have, if you happen to be born with the APOE2 and complement factor H and or the ARMS2 variant. So they all kind of trigger together, which is why some AMD is so much worse than others. So I'm um, moving on into defining geographic atrophy. There's been multiple systems that have tried to define it based on size, um, but there's no international consensus at this point in time. Um, so there's three trials uh, that we listed here, there's the Wisconsin trial, which defined the minimum area of loss to qualify as geographic atrophy to be about 175 microns in size. The CAPT trial specified a diameter greater than 250 micrometers to be geographic atrophy. And the ARES-2 study defined a minimum diameter of 433 micrometers, which is about a third of a disc diameter. So in addition to size, we think about it clinically really as is it foveal involving or is it extrafoveal or juxtafoveal? So, you know, just as a reminder, the ETDRS grid, we added this slide just to remind people of, of sizes of things within the retina. The retinal veins, you know, clinically we were taught that as they exit the optic nerve head, they're between 125 and 140 microns in width, while the optic nerve itself on average measures about 1500 microns. So, you know, this ED EDTRS grid may be something that you can use to um, help estimate size if you're not measuring things directly, but, you know, more of the clinical definition, you may be able to use, you know, the width of the, of the vessels to kind of estimate size as well. Um, Here's a clinical photo. This patient has extrafoveal or juxtafoveal AMD. So, uh, Dr. Elkins likes to use the term uh, foveal splitting, um, sometimes where it's just right on the edge of the fovea. And you know the, the white arrow there is the fovea, and you can see the atrophic change directly above. Um, whereas this patient has foveal involving geographic atrophy and would have poor vision, as we all are aware, based on you know, where they're eccentrically viewing it, probably 2,200, 2,400 count fingers or worse, potentially. So 
Um, going into our historical treatment paradigm for AMD, for dry AMD, we've always recommended starting with the AREDs uh, vitamins. You know, things have progressed and the AREDs 2 trial um, brought us the subtraction of the beta carotene and the addition of lutein and zeaxanthin into the mix. Um, the original ARES trial actually showed us that intermediate AMD or advanced AMD patients on this supplement were at 25% lower risk to progress to advanced AMD in one or both eyes when they took the supplement. Um, and the other interesting thing that they found from the ARED study was that patients categorized as having no or early AMD did not show a benefit with the with high dose supplementation. The biggest thing that we're all aware of at this point is that smoking is the most important modifiable risk factor, and you need to be talking about stopping smoking with your AMD patients. Um, one of the things that came on later and that we found was that the beta carotene, the reason that it was removed is because in patients who were former smokers, it actually was shown to increase the risk of lung cancer. So a good clinical pearl that uh, you may want to think about is if patients tell you they're taking multivitamins, you know, if it does have vitamin A supplementation uh, as a part of that, if they're a smoker or a former smoker, you may want to ask them to stop that. And I think, what are your thoughts on that, Dr. Elkins? Yeah, I do double check because a lot of people are doubling up. Um, we're taking a multivitamin plus they're taking, you know, preservation. And I don't typically see a lot of the original AREDS formulation on the market. In fact, I don't, I can't even recall the last time I actually saw it in a drugstore, but um, a lot of people don't think about vitamin A, um, and there's some decent levels of it in your, um, uh, in your standard multivitamin. So always good to ask about that. In addition to whether or not they're taking a, um, a specific amount of multivitamin. And it is a lipid soluble vitamin as well. So it sticks with you for a while too. Um, so just comparing the formulas again, you, you can see here. Um, the beta carotene was dropped in the AREDS 2, and then we added the lutein and zeaxanthin. Otherwise, the formulas are pretty much the same between the two. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Elkins at this point, and she's going to talk about some possible treatment avenues. So Dr. Rodney kind of set the stage for us for the various ways that our genetics and our environment and stressors set us up for macular degeneration as we get older. So we're going to kind of go through based on um, the breakdown of the different um, aspects of that for what trials we have undergoing um, currently and where we're headed in terms of that. So we'll go to the next one. Okay. So this is a nice way to kind of break down the different options that are out there. And um, you know, the green box are things that are looking at, you know, oxidative stress. So, you know, AREDS formula, obviously, which we just talked about, um, or lutein zeaxanthin, and then some of the kind of holistic type things that some of the um, pharmaceutical companies are looking at. Um, the yellow box on the left-hand side is your visual cycle modulators. So fenretinide, which if anybody remembers, that was like the original Stargardt's drug, right? We were you know, trying to decrease how often the visual cycle occurs. So if you slow down the visual cycle, then there is less um, uh, buildup of these fatty acids and these soaps that form. And so there's less that has to get um, transferred out, um, which just decreases the amount of drusen or in the case of Stargardt's, the amount of flex that you see over time. Um, ALK001 um, is a drug by a company called Alkius. Um, it's actually super interesting because it's an oral medication. So it's something that obviously wouldn't just be injected by retina specialists or done in a surgical setting. Um, and it looks at replacing the hydrogen bonds um, with deuterium, um, which decreases how much of the dimers form and also decreases our um, buildup of these visual cycle. Um, what I call trash basically. Um, and then some miscellaneous stuff, um, like from um, biomodulation, which was kind of like in 2020, it was kind of a hot topic, but, um, it doesn't look like it's going to pan out to really do much. And then we have our neuroprotectants, um, CNTF is ciliary neurotrophic factor, um, which has a lot of interest in the neuroophthalmology arena as well. Um, bromonidine, we've been looking at bromonidine for eternity, but, um, you know, there is um, a lot of interest in a um, bromonidine intravitreal implant, which we'll kind of briefly cover on an, another slide here shortly. Um, 
and then tandosporine, which is just a 5-HT kind of agonist to upregulate that. Um, the two anti-amyloid drugs, like we talked about before, so amyloid, beta amyloid and APOE2 are both important things that are associated with both macular degeneration and uh, Alzheimer's disease. So being able to decrease how much amyloid gets deposited in the drusen um, is also, you know, obviously going to slow down how much degradation uh, occurs in those areas. And then our complement inhibitors, which is obviously, um, the, actually the bottom two are actually not complement. Well, they're sort of complement, but um, so we have a, a bunch of options here. We have pegcetocopolins, hypovray, which we're going to talk about, NGM621, which is a study that's um, uh, a... Um, monoclonal, a humanized monoclonal antibody to complement factor three, um, and vast encapsulated Pegel, which we'll talk about a little bit later as well. Um, eculizumab, which is the cousin to lampalizumab, which actually failed in trials to show any statistical significance. Um, and then, uh, the HMR 59 is a gene therapy looking at increasing CD 59, um, which is another complement factor. And then GT005 was um, owned by a company called Gyroscope, actually got bought by Novartis because they feel like it's potentially going to be a, a hot up and coming drug. Um, and so those um, both look at increasing um, production of, you know, kind of uh, our, um, I think, it's, sorry, my, uh, increasing the, you know, production of like healthier RPE type cells by limiting how much, um, complement degradations, so they work a little differently than our current complement inhibitors. You can go to the next one. Okay. So there were about 20 plus or minus trials ongoing at any time. Um, there's a, there's new ones that come out. I just got an email last Thursday when Dr. Runyon and I ran through this about another new drug that just got, um, uh, investment, like investigational status, um, to run a phase one trial. So there's, there's stuff all the time coming out. Um, the problem with that is that a lot of them just don't make it past phase one. They don't show any early significance that we can really, you know, take home to the bank. And these, these studies are expensive to get a drug to phase three. Um, you're often, often talking about, you know, 5 million or more dollars invested, depending on the drug who bought it, um, you know, and how big the company is. So, um, that's tricky. And then any of the drugs that are currently being used in the European and Asian markets don't often automatically translate. We, our FDA has a very strict system. Those drugs have to be run as first line treatments here. So it's a slow process in the United States in particular to get drugs to trial. So, we're going to go to um, these four main categories of treatment that we're looking at. So for the complement system, we're going to talk a little bit more about Philly um, and then the gather studies, OPH2001 and OPH2003 are the gather studies. That's the Enveric Bios, um, Avast and Captain Peg All drug. Um, Philly, Derby and Oaks are all um, Peg Cetacoplin, which is Cypovray. And then um, Gale is an extension study of those. And then the bromonidine implant is the beacon study. Um, again, it's basically an Osrodex implant that instead of having dexamethasone in it has bromonidine. And the thought is that by injecting that, it releases um, these kind of upregulators to help slow apoptosis over time. Um, and they did have decent results for it, but the patients that showed the best results were ones that had over six disc areas of geographic atrophy to start. So I'm not entirely sure where that drug is going to fall in line with um, other things because six disc areas is obviously nearly the entire macula, but um, we'll, we'll see what, what happens with that. And then in terms of our gene therapies, um, uh, you know, we're looking at um, the HMR1001, Focus, Explore, Horizon, these are all, um, you know, drugs that are looking at trying to inject a medication that's going to allow us to either, you know, produce complement factor inhibitors or complement factor agonists, like in the terms of complement factor I, that actually circulates through your body to decrease complement three, um, C3 and C5. So you want more complement factor I, um, in order for that to work better. Um, so that's kind of the goal of some of these gene therapies. Um, and then, um, Opry gen is, uh, 
basically RPE cells. So the goal is to try to replace different than everything else, um, some of the RPE that has been lost. And by replacing that, obviously that would be a restorative um, vision situation as opposed to all the other ones, which are really just going to be preventative for worsening. None of the other gene therapy, neuroprotective agents or complements, the factor drugs will reverse any damage that's already there. So this is kind of a similar version of the same thing. I just took off the side and kind of um, listed out the different um, membranes. The HMR one I didn't mention is the adenovirus uh, vector drug for C59. The membrane attack complex is, you know, brand, brand, uh, Dr. Ryan showed the screen earlier with all the complement factors making their cascade. And after you go from C3 to C5, you go all the way down to C9. And then after C9, you produce mem membrane attack complex. Um, and that's just what helps, um, you know, obviously your body recognize foreign antigens and go out and, and find those. So by increasing CD59, it can block the formation of the MAC, which is helpful. So, um, you know, all, all things we're looking at, again, that's a phase one study, so we don't have a lot of data on it. So moving on to what we do have data about. So we have, we have two drugs that one, obviously, which we're going to talk about that is approved, and then Iberic Bio's drug, which is looking for, um, I think, believe August 19th is their expected um, date in front of the FDA. So we may by um, before we even start the fourth quarter of the year have the option for two drugs. So that's super exciting given the fact that obviously last year we had none. So Advastin Captopagol, um, which is commercially known as Zymira for the rheumatology market, um, most likely will have a different name. It's a pegylated RNA optimer. It acts as a specific inhibitor of complement factor five. So remember five is downstream of of C3 and Iberic Bio likes that because they feel like C5, because it also has an inhibitory back pathway towards C3 will actually limit it both C5 and C3. So it's going to help control more downstream effects um, because the alternative pathway that Dr. Rania mentioned earlier also funnels a lot of drug uh, or a lot of um, complement back into C3 in this auto loop that it does. So if you can cut that off even more, then that's beneficial as well. So um, their um, two studies, Gather 1 and Gather 2, looked at, um, they were a, a prospective randomized double mass, double uh, sham controlled study. Um, they were a little bit different with their randomization. They did a one milligram, two milligram sham. And then their second version, they did two, four in sham. And in the two, four and sham group, the four milligram dose uh, becomes a little bit tricky because the two milligram dose is 0.1 mLs for an injection. So patients that were in the four milligram group had to have two injections of 0.1 uh, mLs of medication. So everyone in that whole study had to have two injections um, so that obviously they didn't become unmasked, but that does, it is a little tricky um, in terms of what will that will look like in the real world um, once if it is approved. They looked at the mean rate and geographic atrophy. Um, interestingly, also in their study, you could uh, you had to have your GA had to be within 1,250 microns of the fovea, but could not involve the fovea, which is a little bit different than pegcetacoplan. Um, the primary endpoint was the change in GA size over 12 months by using fundosato fluorescence. Um, and then they had secondary endpoints, which included best corrected visual acuity, and then low luminance, best corrected visual acuity, which is a great way to sort of um, think about like doing like perimetry or um, real world vision. Because when we test patients in the lane, you're talking about a perfect scenario. They're you know, in a lane with a well-lit screen, good, crisp, clear contrast on those letters. And no one lives in the real world looking at, or looking at screens that are like this. They're looking at newsprint, which is kind of gray and fuzzy, um, or they're in a dim room or a dim restaurant. And so low luminance VA, um, I think is going to be an interesting um, result for them. So we have a couple slides. This is just kind of the setup of the way that they did the study. So everyone for the first um, 12 months in the gather one study, or for eight, first 18 months in the gather one study had monthly injections. It was a little bit different in gather two um, with, the, with a higher dose. 
Um, so everyone's getting monthly. That is also different than the way that Cypopre was injected as well. So next one. And this is for gather two. So everyone for year one got it monthly for year two. They were then split half continued on it monthly and half continued on it every other month. Um, so that it doesn't make them directly comparable. Um, again, the drugs aren't the same, so it's not directly comparable to pegcetacopelin either, but um, they kind of set it up that way to see kind of as an extension, how do patients do if we start slowing down how often they're on it? So their data looks, looks good. Um, obviously this is a drug that you can't really look at six month data and say, oh, look at the difference because it doesn't make a huge difference. We're trying to prevent worsening. We're not improving anything. So the longer patients are on this drug and their two-year data was just kind of um, shared at some local retina meetings, um, it will probably be fully released at Arvo, um, which I believe is next week. Um, so we'll, we'll get the two-year data really soon, but it looks even better, obviously. The longer you're on the drug, the more reduction. And you can see when you look at these graphs that for the two milligram arm versus sham, they had about a 28% reduction in the size of the GA progression. Uh, and then in the four milligram arm, they had about a 30%. So not a huge difference between two and four. We'll see what it looks like at the 12, at the 24 month mark. Obviously, again, like we just talked about the four milligram dose is two injections, same day 0.1 ml. So a little cumbersome, obviously for injecting in the office. So now, now we're going to talk about pegcetacopelin. So pegcetacopelin was approved uh, February 17th, um, basically became commercially available about seven to 10 days later, goes under the name Cyphobre. Um, they're calling it Cyphobre because it's science, phobia, and retina put together. Um, it is a 0.1 ml injection. Um, so similar to the two milligram dose of Avacin Captain. And then... Um, it does have to be removed from the refrigerator 15 minutes before, which is a little bit um, sort of annoying in, in clinic, but, you know, obviously if you know a patient's coming in and getting it, that's not such a big deal. Go to the next slide. Um, so this is a pegylated complement factor, C3 inhibitor peptide, and it works on C3 and its byproducts that it splits into, which is C3A and C3B. So it blocks C3 and C3B. So thought to stabilize cell membranes, thought to decrease um, phagocytosis. And it works via all three pathways because all three circle back into C3. Um, so it's an important early stream um, place to intervene. Um, it does bind and then prevents the activation of C3B with a very high affinity, decreases the cleavage. So therefore, again, no generation of downstream inhibitors. It does have a very short half-life, but that's true of all retina drugs. Um, it's actually, it's half-life is like four days. Um, so after like eight days, you know, obviously you have a additional reduction. Uh, it's original phase two study was the Philly study and then Derby and Oaks, which are the phase three studies. Um, Derby was a little bit weird. Um, I think I have a slide next that has some data on it. So when you're looking at these slides on the left-hand side, we'll talk about Oaks first because it makes the most sense. So every other month is this dark teal that you see, which at 18 months showed, you know, 17% reduction. Their 24 month data did look better than that. Again, as we expected, the longer you're on it, the better you do. But a 33% reduction in the monthly group. Derby got a little strange because it actually, it actually looked better in um, the every other month with 23% reduction and the every month only had a 17% reduction and they didn't actually meet their end, um, end point initially at 24 months, the study did do better. Um, so it was a little bit weird. The populations are very similar. There wasn't a whole lot of difference between the, the two of them, um, but obviously the, the OS data certainly looked better. You can go ahead one more. Um, and then this is just looking at um, threshold sensitivity. So this is microperimetry, which they did. Uh, similar way to think about the low luminance is microperimetry sensitivity. Um, and you can tell that by the time you hit month 24 in that red box on the left-hand side, that you're really starting to see a separation between the two. Yeah, exactly. So 
preserving more of that sensitivity than for those patients who didn't, uh, who received sham. And then scotoma points. So the left side is mean threshold. So just how much decibel de decrease we had on the right side, these are the actual scotomas. And again, towards the end of the month 24, you're starting to see that separation. So it doesn't seem to translate to quite as much real world difference. But again, you know, these, these aren't perfect drugs. Um, we know they're not perfect drugs, but they are better than, than nothing currently. So the, the one thing that really highlighted um, careful consideration of patients is in the Philly study, in the phase two study, about 10 to 11% of patients developed wet AMD. In um, Derby and Oaks, it was actually about 13%, so slightly higher. Uh, the majority of those patients were in the monthly group. There were a few that were in the every other month. And when we went back and looked at the data, we felt like well, what was actually missed was that these patients had preclinical wet AMD that just had not been diagnosed. And that's what we call this double layer sign. So there's a separation of um, Brooks membrane and the RPE. And so you get these two layers because there actually is a dormant CNV that's formed in those two layers. And so you see that outer, that outer line that you wouldn't see in a standard pigment epithelial detachment. So the majority of the cases were actually able to be picked up um, retrospectively um, beforehand. And the presence of wet AMD is not an exclusion criteria for treatment with this drug. So, but obviously something you want to look out for to counsel patients appropriately. Dr. Elkins, what, how does that compare to the, the rate of neovascular AMD and geographic atrophy patients who aren't treated? What do we know about that? So the, the rate overall for geographic atrophy development is somewhere between 22 to 30% or of wet AMD in all AMD patients is around 22 to 30%, depending on which study you're looking at. So um, you, you already have, a, have an increased risk. Um, you know, these studies don't go long enough probably to really tease out everyone who would get wet, at, wet AMD in those patients um, or in, in this population. Um, but it isn't, you know, drastically, I mean, if anything, it's a little bit lower, but again, we're looking at 24 months versus a lifetime. So approved on the, on the 17th of February, um, they can have subfovial or non-fovial GA. It's really up to the provider as to whether or not they want to treat them with subfovial GA. Their study did not exclude that, which is different than um, Evas and Captain, uh, Zymira. They excluded anyone with foveal involvement in their study. So you could not, um, you had to have pretty decent vision. They were 20, 40 or better in those, in those arms. And so this is a little bit different, um, given as a single 0.1 milligram, uh, 0.1 ml injection, they gave us a large range, 25 to 60 days. So it's up to us whether we want to do every month, every other month, um, really kind of depends probably on each individual provider's choices. It's contraindicated for anyone who has an ocular or periocular infection or um, any current active inflammation. So history of or current. And if you think about this kind of like the be of you disaster that that happened for these patients, you know, there's a small amount of inflammation that happens with these drugs and in certain um, setups like be of you, you can have a devastating inflammatory disease. So we're trying with newer drugs to really be very careful about not injecting people who have this uh, past inflammation. So if they had an anterior uveitis after cataract surgery, that would potentially exclude them. Um, and so you, you want to think long and hard about those. Anyone with past history of endophthalmitis, things like that, you really wouldn't want to choose this drug in there. Again, so if I, oh, go ahead. Um, so if I were to refer you a patient, you know, for, for treatment with this medication, what would be the things that you want to see in the note from me, you know, to help you in yeah, making your absolutely. decision? Obviously, a lot of these patients come to us late stage. They've been followed with their optometrist for, you know, regular macular degeneration checks all the time. And until they progress to either wet AMD or, you know, potentially like in this case, now the GA can be treated or um, can be uh, slowed down. The, 
optometrists are who know these patients the best. So if they had a cataract surgery with some other provider five years ago and had a bout of inflammation afterwards that took a while to control, that would be helpful information to us because we may not want to choose to inject them or, you know, a lot of patients who've even had, you know, mild endophthalmitis, but have great vision afterwards. It isn't something you can necessarily look in the eye and know. So those clinical pearls that, that you possess are important information for us. So any past history of inflammation would be helpful information, certainly going forward. Uh, in addition, on the other slide, I mentioned that you, it's not an exclusionary criteria for wet AMD. So if they've had wet AMD in the past and you as the provider know that, that information would be helpful too. Because sometimes we get referrals that just say like eval of geographic atrophy and there's no additional information. So, um, you know, any any info about them that you can share is always important. And just to clarify, if they do have a history of wet AMD, they can actually receive treatment for geographic atrophy and wet AMD in the same eye, correct? Same eye. We just cannot do both at the same injection visit. So remember it's a 0.1 dose, it's a large dose. So we want to inject those separately. So I actually have one of my patients that's enrolled with Peg C. Copeland and is on treatment. And so she gets Q3 month um, ILEA and she is going to be getting Q2 month um, Cyphobre. So it's a lot of visits for her. It's, um, you know, as we'll talk about with some of these cases, it's, it's a choice you have to make and a, patients have to be willing and committed to coming in because it's going to be a lot of visits for them because of that. Okay. Thanks. Um, so we have about five clinical cases or so we're going to try to get through and we're going to, we're going to talk through these and Dr. Elkins is going to go through her thinking and we'll kind of have some back and forth here. We'll save questions for the end. Um, hopefully you can pick up some clinical pearls. We chose these cases because they're all kind of interesting and unique in their own way. Uh, so we'll get started with case one. This is a 67 year old white male initially referred for wet AMD in the left eye. This was back in July of 2019. He's a former smoker. He has no family history of macular degeneration or retinal disease or blindness. His medical history is significant for hypertension and hyperlipidemia. And he's got good acuity in the right eye at 2020 and the left eye is 2050, pinhole no improvement. I'm gonna show you his fundus here. So there's the right eye and what are you noticing, Dr. Elkins? Yeah, so this has a little bit of uh, increased pigmentation. You can see that, you know, like one plus RP hyper and kind of that ring shape. Um, and then a little bit of atrophy that you isn't really obvious on the color photo, but you can see, you know, the, on the, the beauty of the autofluorescence really kind of highlights those little areas of early early dropout. Um, so there's some changes there and there's a little bit of hyper autofluorescence, which does mean that there are some areas being actively metabolized that probably will turn into GA later. And then here we have the left eye. And again, he had a history of wet AMD previously in the left eye. And you see he's got a, looks like a subretinal hemorrhage um, here in the left eye as well. What else do you notice, Dr. Elkins? Yeah, it's the same kind of picture. He's got a little bit of those two GA patches that you see a little bit of there. And then as well as that little bit of a ring of hyper. So probably some continued GA coming in the future for him. So the diagnosis was intermediate dry AMD in the right eye at, at the time. Um, in wet AMD in the left eye, he received Avastin injections in the left eye with a good initial response, uh, moved to the treat and extend protocol, and eventually became inactive in that left eye. Um, but he later developed progressive geographic, geographic atrophy in both eyes. I'm going to show you some of those scans. So this is um, August of 2019. So this is pretty close to, I think this is about a month after the initial presentation. And we can see the geographic atrophy here and then the nasal retina and this right eye. Um, here we are in the left eye in August of 2019. You see some geographic atrophy there um, as well. So Dr. Elkins, would you treat this patient with Cyphovre at this point if they were in your chair today? So he's relatively young. He's 67. Um, the right eye, I certainly wouldn't treat. Um, you know, he doesn't have, it's a, it's a tiny spot. It's still decently away from the phobia. You know, I would, I would watch that and see how quickly it was progressing. 
Well, left eye, you know, I'm a little bit plus or minus on, um, you know, again, you're committing these people to either monthly or every other month injections, and there's no end point. It's different than wet AMD. You're injecting them for the rest of their life or until the GA progresses, um, whichever happens first. Um, and so I probably would still watch this maybe for a little bit longer um, before we made any commitment to it. He does have great vision in his other eye, um, which obviously is the eye he'll probably be more dependent upon. Okay. So fast forwarding in this patient now, we're three years later. This is November of 2022. Um, you can see he's had pretty significant progression in this right eye as compared to 2019 in the previous slide. And then here we are in February of 2023. So you can see that the, the geographic atrophy is actually enlarged a little bit um, between the two. And here's the left eye significant, significant progression as well with some foveal sparing. Um, here we are in February, 2023, a whole year later. Um, does that change your perspective any? Do you think that you treat the patient now that you've seen hindsight's 2020, right? Right, hindsight's 2020. So of course I would have wanted to treat him. Uh, obviously it makes you want to treat the right eye, which at the time, you know, doesn't seem like it would necessarily need it. And, you know, the the goal obviously is to hopefully catch these people at an intervening place somewhere, you know, in 2020 or 2021, where you saw enlargement, but well outside the fovea and could have started them on treatment and hopefully prevented this, this scenario. But it's, it's difficult because when you look back at this, it's like, you may, it makes you feel like you would regret having not started him. Um, you know, I think, I think this just highlights the importance too when you're making these referrals to our subspecialists to make sure that you're including what data that you have. You know, if we went back and all Dr. Elkins had to treat based off of was, you know, this data, or perhaps we just had one OCT and this is where we were at at this point in time, we don't know the rate of progression. You know, we don't, we don't know where they started and where they're going. Yeah. It's definitely helpful to know the rate of progression, you know, in this, in that case, I probably would still try to treat his right eye with um, pegcetocopelin and see if I could save that last little bit of fixation in there. And that was the better seeing eye, correct? The, right. That was the 20, 2025 or and, 2020. And no wet AMD, so less likelihood of activating wet AMD in the, in that eye. Okay. Um, so case two, this was February, 2020. This is a 75 year old white male initially referred for dry AMD eval. He's a former smoker. His family history of AMD, his brother has it. Um, medical history is significant for diabetes, hypertension, multiple myeloma, and he's status, pa status post to cardiac pacemaker. Um, he's 2020 in both eyes with correction. Let's look at his retinas. So this is again, uh, February of 2020 in the right eye. And what do you see here, Dr. Elkins? So obviously, you know, the red free image here shows some pretty extensive GA. He's 2020 by like the skin of his teeth. Um, this is where like low luminance or microperimetry would really show that he's much worse off than the way that he reads on an ETDRS chart, uh, a pretty extensive GA, but again, still sparing his phobia. So there is real estate to be saved. What about the left eye? Yeah, so on the left eye, there's a little bit of artifact on the red free. So there's a smudgy thing in the middle of red free that looks like GA, but isn't. Um, so he's got some paraphobial GA. This eye's a little bit better. The GA is further out. Um, you know, hopefully you would have a little bit better luck with treating this eye um, over time because you just, there's just smaller lesions overall, less burden. So he was diagnosed with advanced AMD. GA with that, without subfoveal involvement. Um, AREDS2 was recommended for this patient and is monitored every four to six months or so. Um, you know, so again, here's where we kind of started in 2020. Here we are four months later in June of 2020. Here we are, I think the patient was lost to follow up for about 13 months or so, I want to say. So we went from June of 2020 and this is se September of 2022. Uh, the patient didn't come back as they do sometimes. They don't see the need for follow-up when their vision's not affected. We've had some pretty significant progression here. Um, here we are in March of 2023. So, you know, significant progression. Here's the left eye, a pretty similar story. And there's an artifact centrally um, here as well. But you can just see this is pretty rapidly expanding. So what do you think about that patient? 
Yeah. So I think, I think this is a great patient that would have done really well, particularly, you know, starting in that left eye. Um, you know, it, it's a tricky thing. We can inject both eyes. We certainly can. Um, most retina specialists that I've talked to, the ones that ran the studies and um, have looked at these patients extensively are really only planning to inject one eye of patients. Um, and that's just because, again, it's every month or every other month for eternity. And so we're trying to kind of save what we can um, realistically without too much burden on these patients. If you're injecting both eyes, they, you know, it, they may need help getting there if they, you know, don't have good vision in the other eye. So certainly in his left eye, I would, I would treat, I would consider maybe both eyes somewhere down the road, but I would have, I would have started the left eye at that first visit if, if he was open to the option. Okay. I think we have about eight minutes or so left. So we're going to move through these. So case three, 69 year old white female. This is a second opinion for wet AMD in February of 2020. Um, she'd already had three injections in the right eye, one injection in the left eye. Last injections were about three years ago. She's taking AREDS too. She was never a smoker, no family history of AMD, and she is healthy. However, her vision stinks. Uh, count fingers at five feet in the right eye. Left eye's hanging on about 20, 30 or so. Um, so looking at the retina, you know, I think we can all agree large central atrophy here. Um, doesn't appear to be any subretinal fluid. That, that explains why the vision's poor. The left eye, what do you think about this one? What do you see? Yeah, so we have this little, you know, RPE um, clump that's underneath there. You know, you don't see an obvious double layer sign. It's a little difficult because it's kind of a small section, um, small GA on the red free that you can see just superior temporal to the fovea. So, you know, 2025, I believe was her vision in that eye. So. Mm -hmm. She's, she's excellent candidate, already lost vision in one eye. She's going to be highly motivated. She's relatively on the younger side, 69. Um, so this is a, this is a perfect, perfect patient for, but, for considering this drug. But does have a history of wet AMD that she received it treatment. With. AMD, but in the, was it in the right eye? Both. In both eyes. So again, if she reactivates, um, you know, you, you you just have to talk with them about it and say, listen, you know, there's a chance that you will reactivate from this. We can still treat it. Um, but your, your risk is so high that I think, I think this drug would benefit you. Um, so she was deemed inactive at the time, followed every four to six months, no injections were recommended. And again, this is 2020. Um, on subsequent follow-up, she'd now developed progressive geographic atrophy in her better seeing eye. So again, here's the right eye. I'm just going to cycle through this. You can kind of see this enlarging, which is pretty cool. Um, in the left eye, watching this over time, this is March. Uh, so here we are in May of 2019, September of 2020, March of 2022. And those lesions temporarily are, actually all the lesions are getting a little larger. So so I think we already talked about that you would treat that left eye and, and just talk about, you know, the risk of reactivation of the wet AMD, which is also treatable. Do you have any points to add on that one? Uh, okay. Think, yeah. Okay. So case four, 71 year old white male initially referred in September, 2018, dry AMD, taken AREDS to former smoker, family history of AMD, the mother, um, hypertensive, heart disease, status post uh, cabbage or coronary artery bypass grafting, um, arthritis, 2025 acuity in the right eye, 2040 pinholes to 2020 in the left eye. Um, so what do you see here? Yeah, so we have just a little bit of disruption. You know, there's some, there's some strangeness happening in the red free a little bit of darkening. So it looks like there could almost be like a kidney bean shaped area of potential early GA. And you see that disruption, obviously on the Heidelberg scan, nasal to the fovea there. So there's, there's certainly something potentially brewing there. It doesn't, doesn't have very clearly defined borders. And then the left eye, kind of a similar story. Yeah, yeah. Less impressive on the red free, but obviously that nasal GA patch. Okay. So um, diagnosed with dry AMD, again, this is several years ago, continued on the AREDS, followed every four to six months, and she later developed wet AMD in the left eye and had Avastin and ILEA injections. So here's the progression. This is September 2018. 
October of 2020, and we can kind of start to see some geographic atrophy forming here with some choroidal show. October of 2022, and you can see there's this massive dropout out here in the left eye. September of 2018, October of 2020. This is when they developed the wet AMD and we got some fluid. And you can see now there's significant geographic atrophy that's developed in October of 2022. So what do you think now, Dr. Elkins? Yeah, so this is another one where um, it, this would be a harder choice. Um, their progression isn't, it's developing, but it's not super rapid. They're also a relatively sick patient in terms of having had a cabbage, um, and other, you know, health issues. So there are, you know, patients who've had cardiac bypass surgery, um, and are, are ill like that do actually have a, obviously a shorter lifespan. So 71, the GA doesn't look like it's progressing super rapidly. The right eye still has good vision. It might be one where I would just watch, you know, maybe every four months. And then, you know, at some point in time, consider it if I felt like we were progressing rapidly. Um, but you know, I don't think you'd be faulted for going either way. Okay. And our last case here, case five, 87 year old white female referred for dry MD. And this is February of 2023. This is actually a patient of mine. Um, currently taking a reds two every day, not a smoker, no history of AMD in the family, uh, hypertensive diabetes, hyperlipidemia, colon cancer status post colectomy with an ileostomy and uh, corrected vision 2070 and 2040 uh, respectively. So, you know, here's her Optos photos. Yeah, obviously, I kind of see GA there. Kind of see a little bit there. And the left eye also has some geographic atrophy, I think, there, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, just a tiny patch. You can see the vessels and the color. Yeah. So, what do you see in this OCT? Yeah, so this is a, you know, a classic like foveal splitting GA, you know, vision's already dropped to 27D. Um, you know, it's a small lesion, so obviously it could get larger. Um, if this, if their left eye did not see well, um, you might consider it. Again, 87, history of colon cancer, status post colectomy. So not the healthiest of patients. Um, lifespan is probably a little bit reduced. So, you know, I don't know how... I don't know that they would have long enough to get the benefit of the drug. Cause again, we're looking at two, three, four or five years before we're really seeing that progression. So this is a drug you want to get in there earlier than later left eye, some disruption still has good vision at 2040. Um, currently, I don't know. I don't know that I would treat either eye in this patient at this point in time. I'd probably just continue to watch. So uh, non-foveal geographic atrophy in the right eye, intermediate dry AMD in the left, continue to her on AREDs and, you know, probably hold off 